This is a short slideshow that deals with just one aspect of Oates' story, where have you been, where are you going, and that is the mythological basis for it. In week five, I'd given you a short video presentation or PowerPoint on Oates, so I'm not going to repeat any of that. I'm just going to focus on this particular myth and how it applies to the story. This is my interpretation. Your interpretation of the story may differ a great deal, and I hope it does. The notion of the death and the maiden has really murky origins. There's no scriptural basis for it, but as you can see, it's sort of a medieval story that somehow seems to grow up, perhaps as a result of the Black Death, uh, which decimated Europe in the 13th and 14th centuries. About a third of Europe died, and there becomes this whole interest in sort of macabre fiction and stories and death as like a thing, uh, because people die unexpectedly. Nobody really understands what the Black Death is all about. But they see their family, they see their children, they see their parents dying and fellow citizens in large numbers. As I said, about a third of Europe disappears uh, in this period of time. But the story is, as you can see on the slide, it's a young girl. She's very, very pretty, uh, very, very young, right on the verge of becoming a woman. And she becomes more interested in her own appearance. This sounds like, of course, teenage girls since the beginning of time and teenage boys for that matter as well. But this particular myth seems to focus on women. Um, at this point, she's unaware of death. She feels like she's going to live forever. She feels like nothing is ever going to happen to her. And death suddenly just appears. He creeps up on her and takes her to himself. Uh, sometimes there's a dance associated with this. And you'll see uh, in some of the images, uh, the man and the woman, death and the maiden, uh, dancing with each other. And whether this is part of a courtship ritual, whether this is just something that they do, I really don't fully understand. There's not a whole lot of literature about this. It's more of a visual image kind of thing than it is a written document in any place. And that's why I don't have any links on our website to any stories about the death and the maiden. But it's a it gets a hold on people. And you'll see in the slideshow some modern paintings that focus on this image as well. Uh, sometimes you'll see in some writers will uh, equate sex and death, that the idea of orgasm is kind of a little death as well, the petite mort, as they call it. Um, at the same time, I think it's, it's connected to this larger issue about how we as human beings continue the species, that we, uh, we live, uh, we procreate, and then we die. And we do this over and over and over again for thousands and thousands of years. This is one of the earliest representations of it. It's an oil painting by the German artist Hans Baldung, and it's from the early part of the 16th century. Most of the portraits of this, you're going to see death show up as a skeleton or as a very skeletal-like figure, and you're going to see the woman as nude and looking at herself in a mirror. The female form was considered to have kind of perfect proportions uh, back in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, and so you tend to see a lot of naked women in these pictures. Um, it's not because these guys were, were Purian or they were they consider these pornographic, but they consider the female form and indeed the male form, if you look at like Michelangelo's David, to be uh, images of perfection, particularly in the 16th and 17th centuries. As, as the Renaissance takes hold in more and more parts of Europe, you begin to see more and more realistic representations of the human form and usually naked. Uh, another aspect of this, I think, that's important to remember is that clothes were considered something that could disguise reality, could disguise truth. And so a more truthful, a more honest figure would normally be shown in the nude. Even the male figure over here on the right-hand side of this uh, image, this guy who looks like, what? You're taking my girlfriend? What? Um, is an idealized, mostly nude male figure. The little cherub in the bottom is supposed to be Cupid, I think. And so this, this comes from this another great myth about Venus and Adonis that we could get into later. But that certainly doesn't have much to do with the story. Okay, Here's another Baldung painting. It's an etching from a few years later. And here, death is explicitly a skeleton. The woman is explicitly a blonde. Uh, and she's looking at us at this, rather than looking at a mirror. The little figure in her arms, I'm not sure what that is. I don't think it's her child because she does not look like she's ever had a child if you look at the, how her figure is presented. Uh, so it may be um, some other image of which I'm just not aware. Here is an Italian version of this. This is actually a little bit earlier than some of the other ones. And here we see a very androgynous figure. 
This one is called Death and the Maiden. To me, it looks more male than female. The breasts are small, but there's no male genitals here, so I'm really not quite sure. Perhaps this is meant to be androgynous, and it's meant to be a young man or a young woman looking at him or herself in a mirror. Notice the mirror again, the concern with appearance and death creeping up uh, from the left-hand side, which is normally where death appears, the left side of a painting. Uh, this comes from the Latin sinister, uh, which is still the Italian word for left, sinitra. And so you get the idea of sinister is associated with the left side of a painting. The right side of a painting is normally associated with uh, dexterity because the Latin word for right, dextare, of course, most people are right-handed. Certain religions have uh, different roles for different hands to play. So you can see it's kind of set up to, to reflect these universal kinds of images. Here's a modern painting. This is by Edvard Munch. You probably know him best for the screen. In fact, I have a little blow-up screen doll, screen doll on my desk. I got it when I worked in the Pentagon 20-odd years ago, and it seems to work. But here you can see that Death and this woman are dancing uh, with each other, and the woman seems almost seduced by him. The male figure is indistinct. The female figure is a clearly female. I mean, we can tell that from the long hair, uh, from the angle of the body, the indication of breast. Uh, and again, she's shown naked in this thing. We'll see some other images that will change this idea a little bit as we go on. Here is a pen and ink drawing. I'm not sure if this is a study for the other painting or not, and I don't know if this particular image, which I found online, is reversed or not, but here the death figure is on the right-hand side, not on the left. I don't know if that means anything or if just the image is reversed. This may in fact be a study for the other painting because you can see the similarities between the two uh, female figures. This is a 19th late 19th, early 20th century painting done by a woman artist. And here, the figure of death comes in the form of a female dark angel with a lamp. And the young woman looks a lot younger than the women in the monk paintings or the women in the um, earlier Renaissance paintings. She looks like she's 12, at least to me. And she looks like this looks like almost like this is in a boarding school or something. I don't know. I just get that impression, but I, I may be wrong. This is a lunette. It's actually a painting mounted on a wall that's been removed, and that's why you have this fuzzy stuff kind of up here around the edge. It's canvas that was mounted to a wall and then taken down. But I think the, the salient part here is first the, uh, the striking appearance of death in the form of an angel and in the form of what looks to me like a female angel. But you may disagree. You may decide that this particular death image is a male. Uh, here's a, another 1900 painting. Uh, done by a German artist, Adolf Herring, uh, also Death and a Maiden, where here you can see the woman is scantily clad. Uh, death is a, clearly a, a human figure of some kind, but what it exactly looks like, we don't know. We can see the bony skeleton-y kinds of things on the hands, and we also see death in this black shroud. That seems fairly typical, it seems to me. Uh, here's Egon Schiele. You may know him as one of the most famous late uh, 19th, early 20th century artist. His paintings go for hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is a Death and the Maiden painting that he did. I'm not sure quite when. I want to say this was before World War I, but I'm not honestly sure. Here, Death is a recognizable human figure, um, a male. And you can see the female figure here is dressed in female clothing that may or may not be roughly contemporary with the period. The background appears to be rocks. I mean, I have no idea what's really going on in this painting. But it's you see this white thing down here, and you get the sense that perhaps this is some kind of a shroud. But note also the elongation of the arms, that she's becoming a skeleton, kind of as, as we as, as uh, we watch the painting unfold. We also see that her legs look like they're normal-sized human legs. And it's almost like her body, as it comes in contact with the figure of death over here on the left, nah, 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 is beginning to turn into its skeletal after-death form. Is My sense is that as this process goes on, she becomes more and more skeletal. If we could go, you know, if this painting were a movie and it kept going, we would see her turn into a skeleton before our eyes. Death and a Maiden becomes a film and a play uh, Ariel Dorfman is a Chilean writer, and she writes this play in the late 80s when uh, Chile has come out of a period of tremendous political repression. This is the Chile, the country in South America, and it was turned into a movie in 1995. And 
It's the idea of a woman who's taken prisoner earlier in her life and then is uh, returned to her husband. And then her husband brings home years later the man who tortured her. And so the film is kind of the story of, of how these two interact with each other. It's a sad, odd film, uh, worth watching if you can find it. I won't spoil it for you. Here's a couple of photographs. The first one here is of the kind of the model for Arnold Friend. This is Charles Schmidt. And as you know from the, the notes in the story in her textbook, uh, Joyce Carol Oates read a Life magazine article in 1966 that talked about the 1964-1965 murders that this man, Charles Schmidt, committed in Tucson. Here he's being arrested. And you notice a couple of Arnold Friendly-like things about him. One, he's relatively short. Uh, as you can see. And two, he's got these boots on him. Uh, if you remember in the story, uh, there's a number of references to his boots and the odd shape they are and the uh, the odd way that Arnold Friend carries himself. Uh, Schmidt was, I think, five foot one, five foot two, and he stuffed his boots with like crushed up cans and newspaper and stuff uh, in order to make himself look taller. He murdered three women, uh, all in Tucson, all within a year or so, and was arrested because people recognized him or recognized the women that he had hung out with uh, in this period of time. And what I didn't know until I was researching this slideshow is that he went to prison in 1965 and then was murdered in prison in 1975. Uh, we only have the story in Life magazine to kind of record this. Here's my last slide, and this is a picture of Laura Dern, who was the Connie figure in the 1985 film adaptation of the story. It's not exactly the same. It's much longer. It's much more complex. Um, it's also, in its own way, a little bit more realistic, I think, than the story is. The story veers into myth pretty quickly. The movie stays pretty well grounded uh, to real human beings interacting with each other. But perhaps this will give you an idea of what Connie might have looked like.